Hello, I'm Janelle Paris. This is Rappler Talk. On September 19, the Department of Health declared a polio outbreak in the Philippines. This marks the return of the disease after 19 years. The DOH declared the outbreak after they confirmed a case of the disease in a three-year-old girl from Lanao del Sur, and the next day confirmed another case, this time in a five-year-old boy from Laguna. There were similarities with the cases, one being that the, the polio came from what is called the vaccine-derived polio virus type 2, which we will discuss later on. And the other similarity was that they both lived in relatively congested communities that practiced open defecation and had poor sanitary practices. We are joined today by Dr. Rabindra Abeya Singha of the World Health Organization. He is the WHO's country representative to the Philippines, and he will help us make sense of the outbreak and enlighten us as well about um, WHO and DOH and other partners' responses to the disease and how we can prevent other diseases from spreading. And these should be diseases that no longer exist. Dr. Rabi, thank you for joining us. Hi, Janelle. Thank you for having me. Okay, so let's dive right into it. Um, polio, it's back in the Philippines. How serious is this and how did it happen? So let's be clear, this is, this is polio, but this is what we call vaccine-derived polio. This is somewhat different from normal polio or polio myelitis caused by the wild polio viruses. Uh, however, having said that, WHO takes it very seriously when we have vaccine-derived polio cases also because vaccine-derived polio cases also can result in paralysis mm -hmm. and death. So it is a very significant event. WHO remains very concerned about the situation in the Philippines. Uh, we uh, have uh, worked with the government since the identification of the virus. Uh, in environmental samples uh, to uh, strengthen surveillance looking for cases. Uh, that was the result of which we found these two cases in the child in Lanao del Sur and in Laguna. Um, and as a response to this situation, following confirmation that the case is caused by vaccine-derived polio virus, uh, we are working with the Department of Health and our other partners, UNICEF and others, mm -hmm. to mount a response, which would mean uh, carrying out additional immunization rounds, uh, covering particularly the gap in immunization, and to ensure that all children under five years have the necessary mm -hmm. protection from this polio virus. Okay, so you mentioned that um, this is a special kind of virus, um, that being it's, vac it's called vaccine-derived. So I've, I've um, received some questions on Twitter um, um, asking about, you know, the, the name, it, it's called vaccine-derived. So it kind of paints vaccines in, in, in a sort of, you know, negative light. Like um, some people have asked, so are vaccines safe if there is vaccine-derived poliovirus? So how are you, um, how would you clear that up? For, um, for so let's, let me explain what we mean by a vaccine-derived poliovirus. Um, so the vaccines are two types. There are the oral polio vaccines and the injectable polio vaccines. The oral polio vaccine contains a mix of viral species of wild polio viruses. Um, there's two types that are currently globally circulating, that's type 1 and type 3. So what we call the bivalent oral polio vaccine contains a mix of these viruses. But what's significantly important is that the virus contained in the vaccine is a weakened virus. So it cannot cause disease. It only causes immunity to develop in the recipient. Yeah. So this is significantly important for people to understand. Uh, before I explain the, what we mean by vaccine-derived polio, let me also clarify what is the injectable polio vac virus vaccine. So the injectable vaccine is actually a mix of all three types of viruses, but in this case, they are dead viruses. So they also help in the development of immunity. 
So, uh, vaccine derived polio viruses, what happens is when the oral polio vaccine is administered to a child, mm -hmm. uh, obviously through the mouth, mm -hmm. the, the virus multiplies in the gut of the child and it builds what we call gut immunity. Uh, in this process, the child also excretes the virus for a few days and where sanitation is appropriate, this doesn't pose a okay. challenge, but where sanitation is weak, uh, there is a likelihood that this virus mm -hmm. can be picked up mm -hmm. by and other children. Sure. Now, this is not actually a problem, this is actually a benefit, mm -hmm. because if a small portion of those children are not vaccinated, this will them. result in them getting immunity, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm and they will develop in immunity mm -hmm. and in the normal course of things that small portion of children usually hopefully less than five percent of the children's population will become immune and the vaccine would then die out because everybody in the community has mm -hmm. immunity mm -hmm. what happens in communities where vaccine coverage is low is that those other kids get infected and they excrete the virus and from them it goes to another uh, generation mm -hmm. of kids and another generation of kids and like this the virus continues to keep on circulating mm -hmm. among kids who have not been vaccinated mm -hmm. now as i said usually the vaccine would the virus will disappear from the environment in three to four weeks but because there is a large cohort of children who have not been immunized mm -hmm. this continued transmission could continue and may continue for several years and when this happens that weakened virus with which we initially started starts changing mm -hmm. as it goes through people goes into the environment goes into new people mm -hmm. it starts acquiring little changes mm -hmm. and somewhere along the way that virus acquires the capacity to cause disease again right and when that happens, we call it vaccine-derived polio. Mm -hmm. Of course, that would not happen if we maintain good coverage mm -hmm. among our kids. So that's why WHO recommends that we vaccinate 95% or more of all yes. children to actually protect everybody. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the DOH said that um, the little girl from Lano del Sur who got polio was not vaccinated and that the five-year-old boy, I think the DOH um, from Calabarzon from that region clarified that um, he was kind of late in his vaccination schedule. I think he was... I think he completed yeah, all his vaccines. He completed them, but um, it w like I think one or two of the doses were late. So how important is um, not just vaccination, but getting vaccination on time? Uh, it's important that kids get vaccination on time because that helps in the strengthening of the immunity. Mm -hmm. If the vaccine schedule is interrupted, the immunity buildup gets hampered. Mm -hmm. So in the Philippines, the DOH has a vaccine schedule of three doses of oral polio vaccine to be administered at one and a half, two and a half, and three and a half months. And together with the dose at three and a half months, usually an injectable polio virus dose is also administered. Mm -hmm. uh, the and when this is done, kids are usually fully protected. Uh, now, unfortunately, what we see now is that on a national level, that coverage with the three oral polio vaccines is around 60 percent, mm. 65 percent. 60 around that, yeah. Yeah, and um, the coverage with the three doses of OPV and the IPV is around 40 percent so what that would mean is that nearly three of five kids under five years are not fully protected mm -hmm. right and that's the danger yeah. so as you mentioned if you look at the girl in lanao del so uh, due to various challenges that child had not had any of the doses mm -hmm. yes. so was totally vulnerable. Mm -hmm. The case in Laguna is different. Mm -hmm. The child in fact had the three doses, mm -hmm. uh, but that child is 
special because that child yes. has several other complications yeah. uh, with a weak immune system. You were talking about vaccines now. Um, in the history of WHO's partnership with the DOH and the Philippine government, how were, what are the trends like in vaccine hesitancy? Because I think there was um, a drop in confidence in vaccination, I think late 2017. I think a study from um, a London um, um, a London medical um, school or, or, or group found that um, it dropped um, in 2018 from um, a considerable um, um, rate from 2013, I think. So how has um, the trends in, in the trend in vaccine hesitancy changed since you know the WHO partnered with DOH? So let me start by explaining what vaccine hesitancy is. Mm -hmm. Okay. So vaccine hesitancy is when parents don't access vaccines for their children mm -hmm. in spite of the vaccines being available. Okay. And that could be attributed to three main groups mm -hmm. of causes. One is largely complacency. People mm. believe that these diseases are no longer relevant to us. We are protected and we don't need to worry about it. We don't need to vaccinate our kids, mm -hmm. which is a myth as we see with the outbreaks of, uh, in this case, the vaccine derived polio, but also measles. Yes. And now we hear of a resurgence of diphtheria. The second issue is that um, for reasons of inconvenience, uh, people are busy, yeah. um, sometimes for circumstantial reasons, kids are left with caregivers mm -hmm. because the parents are working in another town or another country and they don't receive their vaccines. And finally, the third big group of factors that contributes to vaccine hesitancy is a lack of confidence in the vaccines, yeah. right? And so because of that, people hesitate to actually give their kids the vaccines. Mm -hmm. Now, that vaccine hesitancy, as I want to reiterate, it's the availability of the vaccine and not taking it. Mm -hmm. Right. So when we talk of vaccine hesitancy, there are multiple reasons yes. that could have attributed to that. Mm -hmm. But vaccine hesitancy is based on the fact that people do have access to vaccines. But sometimes we also don't have access to vaccines mm -hmm. yeah. because the local health center is closed mm -hmm. because lack of staff. Yeah. Uh, so you have to go very long distances to access the vaccine. Center is open, but the vaccines are out of stock. Mm -hmm. That's not vaccine hesitancy. Those are logistical challenges mm -hmm. that we face. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you look at Lana del Sol, there yeah. were also other issues which resulted in logistical challenges mm -hmm. recently in the recent past. Mm -hmm. So all of this complicates the situation of how do we ensure all of our children get access mm -hmm. to Vaccine. Yeah, now that you bring that up, actually, the DOH um, a few weeks ago, um, they, they explained um, the results of this survey that they did in Manila households in the city of Manila. Um, and they said one of the primary reasons that um, kids were unable to be vaccinated was because they were not around during the time of door-to-door -door campaigns. So do you think there should be some uh, reconsideration of how these camp these vaccination campaigns are conducted because if they're not around during door-to-door -door campaigns maybe there's a better way to conduct um, vaccination campaigns so that's what we are now discussing with the doh mm -hmm. and the partners about what kind of response we need to mm -hmm. implement in the areas that the response to this situation is being uh, launched mm -hmm. and that will happen in mid-october mm -hmm. so one of the things we are discussing is the possibility of having a mixed campaign. Mm -hmm. So not only having fixed points where the vaccine is available, but also coupling that with house visits mm -hmm. um, and giving more options like the vaccination programs being there for longer periods of time throughout the day, mm -hmm. recognizing that parents have to go to work and sometimes they come in mm -hmm. late. And so if the vaccines is only till four o'clock, Mm -hmm. They cannot access them. Mm -hmm. So we are looking at multiple factors which could have contributed to this low coverage and mm -hmm. we're trying to find solutions for that. Mm -hmm. uh, the other issue is that we also recognize that uh, sometimes the caregivers 
don't have the permission from the parents. Yeah. And so we are advocating that this be a national response. Mm -hmm. All leaders in the community, political mm -hmm. leaders, business leaders, the clergy, mm -hmm. everybody needs to encourage the kids to be vaccinated. Mm -hmm. But importantly also, I think it's, it's now before the campaign in mid-October starts that those caregivers who are looking after children need to get consent, right? Mm -hmm. Because once the campaign starts, if you can't contact the parents and you haven't got consent, kids are not going to be protected. Mm -hmm. So our message to viewers is if you're a caregiver, you need to get the necessary consent from the parents yeah. before the campaign starts. Mm -hmm. And how are the you know stocks for for the uh, vaccines? Um, In this particular instance, the response will be supported by WHO and UNICEF. Mm -hmm. So the vaccines will be brought in free of charge to the government. Okay. And uh, we have done the calculations based on the number of children that need vaccines mm -hmm. and adequate stocks will be available. Okay. And I it will be a challenge to get of getting it to the necessary local centers. Yes. That's going to need a lot of support at the local level mm -hmm. from the regional, provincial, local government units mm -hmm. on exactly how many vaccines need to move to which places mm -hmm. because it's critically important that when the campaign starts, the vaccine should be available at all those points in adequate quantities. Mm -hmm. So we have still a lot of work to do over the next two weeks as we prepare for the response. Mm -hmm. Together with DOH, UNICEF, Rotary International and everybody else who is partnering in this effort. In the news, I think there's a lot of, you know, technicalities. There are there a lot of technicalities about polio and um, the vaccines and the types of polio viruses and all that. Do you think, um, you know, you can be candid, like has there been any shortcoming in, in terms of how media has covered the disease and, and you know, other related diseases? Do you so, think there's any, how can we do better? Um, no, I think just even this kind of interview, just informing people that there is an issue and there is a response being planned and what they need to do. Mm -hmm. I think it's important. It's an important role that the media can play, mm -hmm. uh, because as we know, different people from different socio-economic strata access different kinds of media. So uh, we need to make available the message in locally appropriate languages and channels, so that all sectors of community can get this message. Mm -hmm. And that I think media is the most suited. Uh, arm to do that mm -hmm. on behalf of the yeah. government and the people. To zoom out a bit, on a global scale, which other countries have polio and how are their responses to the disease? So, as I mentioned, uh, we have wild polio virus transmission mm -hmm. currently only in two countries, mm -hmm. Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, basically, in all other countries, the transmission of wild polio virus has been interrupted. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so WHO is working towards the eradication of polio, but that would mean that we have to ensure that all viola polio virus transmission everywhere in the world has been stopped. Mm -hmm. um, besides that, we continue to see a couple of vaccine-derived polio outbreaks affecting countries. And those countries usually are countries which have very low uptake in their vaccine programs. And so we continue to work as an organization in supporting those countries to strengthen their health systems, their vaccine delivery systems, and their surveillance systems to look mm -hmm. for possible cases. I think the term you used is technical. You said interrupted the, the, the transmission of, of wild polio virus. Does it mean it can you know return no so no. that okay. so as we mentioned there's three types of yes. wild polio virus and type 2 is now already eradicated mm -hmm. it's nowhere in the world mm -hmm. uh, other than in containment facilities in laboratories mm -hmm. um, and uh, we very much believe that also type 3 
is more or less so, but this is still to be confirmed. Uh -huh. um, so, because of this, we are now looking at most immunization programs only use uh, oral polio vaccine containing types 1 and 3. What can the Philippines and health officials and, and other groups involved in health do to um, further arrest the, you know, the deterioration of health conditions that result in, in things like you know, the return of polio or polio outbreak and, and other, other diseases, other vaccine preventable diseases? So I think following on on the measles outbreak mm -hmm. and this polio uh, vaccine derived polio outbreak, the message is clear that we need to strengthen our routine immunization system. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, WHO views this outbreak as an opportunity to work with the DOH, the government of the Philippines and other partners to sustainably strengthen the vaccine preventable disease programs, the immunization programs mm -hmm. in the Philippines. Um, I think this is critically important because on the longer term, if we want to prevent outbreaks of vaccine preventable diseases, we need to use this opportunity and the lessons that we have identified to strengthen the system and make lasting changes so we can protect the Filipino children from future outbreaks. And uh, how are other countries dealing with, you know, similar resurgence of diseases like, um, well, not polio because... Um, We've had vaccine-derived polio outbreaks here okay. in the Western Pacific region mm -hmm. also. So we had a vaccine-derived polio outbreak in Papua New Guinea mm -hmm. in late 2017, and that has now been arrested. Okay. Similar to that, we had a vaccine-derived polio outbreak in the Lao People's Democratic Republic. Again, mm -hmm. that has now been arrested. So WHO has the knowledge and the mechanisms on how to do that, but that can only be done in partnership with the government yes. and importantly, the other stakeholders who support this effort mm -hmm. representing the Global Polio Elimination mm -hmm. Initiative. And another aspect of, of, of polio and polio eradication is, of course, sanitation. Um, and I think the DOH pointed out that um, the communities of the two children who caught polio, um, they were actually pretty congested and they had open defecation. So how would you stress the importance of, of good sanitary practices? Yeah, so that we reinforce the need to strengthen access to good sanitary mm -hmm. practices and safe water mm -hmm. uh, that has not been polluted by possible excreta. Mm -hmm. uh, both of these are important and if you notice uh, these communities are overcrowded settlements uh, which certainly lack access to good sanitation and um, safe water. Uh, so in, in the circumstances and as part of good hygiene, we do recommend that people use safe water and by that we mean water that has been boiled to mm -hmm. destroy the virus mm -hmm. um, for consumption, but also that we reinforce the habit of washing hands properly with soap mm -hmm. after going to the toilet. Mm -hmm. So will the vaccination campaign also um, consist of, you know, um, like an information drive um, to get um, parents to practice good hygiene and, and, and good sanitation at It home? certainly is the plan and uh, we believe that the Health Promotion Bureau in the DOH mm -hmm. is preparing a massive campaign mm -hmm. on those mm -hmm. lines. Mm -hmm. Is the WHO involved in um, any effort regarding um, zero open defecation or are you just purely with the vaccination? No, no. Them? So, I mean, we support that effort, but there mm -hmm. are the partners who play a much bigger role in that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. That is certainly the goal. Mm -hmm. Well, um, thank you so much, Dr. Ravi, for joining us. Thank you, Janet. Um, this has been Rappler Talk. Thank you.